Now, uh, first of all, we'll follow the same format as the last time. Let me speak for about 35 minutes in the discussion, and then when the discussion appears out, I talk again and we have a final discussion. Okay? Now, um, uh, apologies, it seems that in my syllabus I promised to talk about the true false truth of the true truth theory today, and in fact I had misremembered that I was going to speak about skillful means. But this is uh, providential because chronologically the, the four themes uh, come in that order. The first theme was emptiness, and we looked at the earliest Mahayana sutras. Uh, at least we looked at the Heart Summary, which is a late, a late the Heart Sutra, which is a late summary of those early perfection of wisdom sutras. The second week we talked about non-duality, and we looked at the Vila Makirti Sutra. This is the Locus Classicus for that topic of non-duality. Now, the Locus Classicus for skillful means is the Lotus Sutra. I think it comes after the Vila Makirti Sutra because it's longer, it's more elaborate, um, perhaps less intellectually stimulating. Uh, my impression is it comes a little bit later than the Vila Makirti Sutra. I don't know if there's any connection between the two. I don't think either sutra shows any influence of the other. Paul might know something about that. So this is a suitable place to move next. And it introduces the theme of skillful means. The theme of the true truths. That phrase, the true truths, dva satya, true truths or true realities, is found in earlier Buddhism, in Abhidharma literature, uh, that's to say the kind of scholastic philosophical branch of the Buddhist canon. Um, but it doesn't take on its specific Mahayana meaning, the meaning it has in Mahayana Buddhism, until Nagarjuna. And Nagarjuna, of course, comes later than the three sutras. So I'll come to Nagarjuna next week and I'll try to expound Nagarjuna in its full majesty and locate where the true truth fits in in his, in his philosophy. But today, instead of writing a new paper, I just reprinted two papers. One is from this very interesting book by Richard Carney, a very old friend of mine, who is coming to Japan next year, invited, uh, arranged by um, Maurice Atkinson, uh, along with William Desmond, who is Maurice Atkinson's mentor, and myself. We are the three Cork philosophers, and we're going to have <laughs> three a, Irish. No, no, no. We're all from Cork, so we can right. call ourselves the three, three Cork. Cork philosophers, and we are bringing. Irish wisdom to Japan, <laughs> and then in a, hopefully in a second trip, a second traveling circus in Ireland, we will bring Japanese wisdom to Ireland. So the first one is successful. This, if the first one is successful. So this looks like a promising adventure. That, that book is typical of the kind of thing Richard is very interested in, hospitality. Hospitality between cultures, between religions, between philosophies. And it's a quite stimulating book. Um, and then after that, I want to look at an essay I wrote on skillful means, which pretty much exhausts all I have to say about that subject. And that's from another very enterprising person, Catherine Corney, who, like Richard, teaches at Boston College. She's organized five of these symposia uh, on different aspects of interreligious dialogue, not just Buddhism, Islam. Uh, Hinduism as well. Um, and the five, the five topics are Criteria of Discernment in Interreligious Dialogue, 2009, Interreligious Hermeneutics, 2010, Interreligious Dialogue and Economic Development, 2011. That was because the patron of the, 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 of the, of the um, series, the, the, the man funding it, insisted on this topic. And in fact, it was a very interesting uh, debate. Um, I do, she, she mentions two forthcoming ones here, but I'm not sure if they came out in exactly that form. Interreligious dialogue and the cultural shaping of religions, interreligious dialogue and utopia. 
Um, so before talking about skillful means, let me just look at my essay for Richard Carney's volume uh, with the title Western Hospitality to Eastern Thought. Uh, let me say that I have a negative attitude to the current situation of East-West dialogue because I don't think <coughs> Uh, there's, two, there's two fronts, two major fronts on which it happens. One is theology, and the other is philosophy. I feel the Christian-Buddhist dialogue is rather stagnant, um, partly because it's been inhibited by the sectarian closure of so many churches and indeed so many Buddhist denominations and especially in Japan, where there's so much compartmentalization between uh, academic disciplines and between religious organizations. Um, and also because it kind of ran out of steam in the sense that the, there was a phase of intense speculative excitement about 20 years ago, uh, Masao Abe and people like that talking about God and emptiness and kenosis all sorts of things, dynamic shunyata. And I feel that has run out of steam and a new, a new uh, theological inspiration uh, isn't really thriving at the moment, as far as I can see. As to the philosophical encounter, well, the problem there is there is uh, a philosophical encounter which at the moment, it seems the most dynamic form is uh, the encounter between Anglo-Saxon analytical philosophy and uh, uh, Madhyamaka Buddhism. And I regret, you were at the Vienna conference two years ago, all the lectures were in English. And this means that the English mentality and the mentality of analytical philosophy and the mentality of materialistic reductionism, excuse me, is prevailing in Buddhist Christian uh, Buddhist philosophical encounter. Um, at the moment, but of course that's a temporary situation, and on both fronts, both theological and philosophical, the potential is so huge, the implications are so vast, the, the harvest is so great that we have no doubt there will be tremendous, exciting developments in the future. But I just want to look back today at the 200 years history of the very sporadic and very spotty uh, relationship between Western philosophy and Buddhism. In the beginning of this, I talk about uh, West, uh, Christian hospitality to Greek philosophy, and also how Christianity um, gave a bear hug to the Hebrew Bible. You know, Marcion said we should forget about the Hebrews, the Greeks, the, the Jews, they're, they're, they're just primitive. But Christianity said, no, 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 of course we can't. That's the root of our religion. But what they did is they gave a hospitable embrace to Judaism, but on their own terms. They gave a Greek, Christianizing, allegorizing interpretation of the Old Testament which had begun, actually, within Judaism itself, in, in the work of people like Philo of Alexandria. Uh, and in later history, Philo became a kind of honorary father of the church, whereas the Jews tended to keep him at a distance, because he was so Hellenizing. Um, and Judaism had to build itself up in resistance to this. Um, now, there's a wonderful book by Urs App on the, it's called The Birth of Orientalism, which is not a good title, but uh, it's about the intensive interest in Buddhism and in other Indian and Chinese religions before the 19th century, because people think it's only the 19th century, you have the Oriental Renaissance, the sudden discovery of Buddhism. But that's not true, there was an awful lot going on. Unfortunately, uh, it was 
partly hidden in the archives of missionary reports and the Jesuits as well, writing back to their superiors in Rome. And then it is partly a matter of philosophers kind of hijacking the whole thing, uh, trying to prove their own enlightened ideas, their own enlightenment ideas, uh, piggybacking on these missionary reports. So there was ample uh, room for distortion and misunderstanding. Um, I'm sure I mentioned before the Italian uh, Ippolito Desideri, Ippolito Desiderio, is that right? Ippolito Desiderio, Desideri, Desideri, yes. Uh, I don't have access to his texts, but he uh, spent 14 years in Tibet, and he's the first European to master Tibetan language and culture. And he prayed to God that he could understand the Madhyamika philosophy. And then he said, not only did I understand it, I mastered it. Proud boast. And this is the figure that, again, was completely forgotten and is now being rediscovered. Uh, I think I also mentioned that David Hume, as a young man, lived in La Flesh for a few years, where he wrote his first, perhaps greatest book, The Treatise on Human Nature. And um, Alison Gopnik uh, makes a very convincing case that in La Flesh, where he talked with the, with the Jesuits, many of whom had been missionaries and who knew something about Buddhism, uh, he came under the influence of Buddhism. Not a very profound influence, but enough to give him that amazing chapter where he demolishes the self. The way he attacks the self in the treatise on human nature uh, sounds very like the kind of thing you might read in the questions of King Melinda, this famous Buddhist text. Uh, he says, I look into my consciousness and I see the self. But what do I find? Oh, I find this, I find that. I don't find any self. It's just like um, Nagasena in that dialogue with King Menander, where he says, look at the chariot. Where is the chariot? Here's the wheel, here's the seat, here's the the shaft, where's the chariot? The chariot doesn't exist. Um, and <clears throat> then in his later uh, parts of that treatise, he keeps talking about the self. But what he means, I think, is the illusion of self. The illusion of self. He says all our passions of pride and shame are rooted in the self. What he means is the illusion of self. So if you read the treatise on human nature, in that key, you get the extraordinary discovery that Hume is the first Western philosopher to be deeply influenced by Buddhism. Um, but then you have the, the dramatic discovery of, um, of Sanskrit, really, in, in Germany mostly in the 19th century. Germany and France, Eugène Bournouf in France. Um, which created great enthusiasm and a, a kind of a, a commonplace of this whole period is we are now standing on the threshold of a new renaissance, what Greek and Latin culture was to the 15th century renaissance. Indian and Sanskrit culture will be to the 19th century, oriental renaissance. Um, and it's, it's kind of heartbreaking to read all this because so little came of these great books, you know? Um, look at page 20, 25 of my handout. What became of the Oriental Renaissance, which Jules Michelet, the great historian, impressed by the labors of Eugène Bournouf, the, the French, the, the greatest French scholar of, of, of Buddhism at that time. Um, he had got Sanskrit texts from Brian Hodgson, who had been a British official in Tibet, who had gathered together a huge uh, cache of, of important Buddhist texts, um, and he translated the Lotus Sutra from Sanskrit into French. It's the first Western translation of the Lotus Sutra. Anyway, what became of the Oriental Renaissance, which Jules Michelet, impressed by the labors of Eugène Bournouf, envisaged as reuniting the human race, with Buddhism and Christianity functioning as its two spiritual lungs? Isn't that a sublime vision, right? 
and it's a vision that can still come true in my naive opinion. Sadly, just as the Renaissance vision embodied in the masterpieces of Raphael and Michelangelo was lost in the bitter, narrow fuse of the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, so the Oriental Renaissance was put on hold and Europe succumbed to forgetfulness of India, a philosophical amnesia. That's the title of Roger Paul Troyes' book, L'Oubli de Land. Roger Paul Troyes is a journalist, but he's a very good journalist, and his accounts of, of this whole um, culture and history of East-West encounter, I find very illuminating. Um, Instead of a great meeting of minds, a fusion of horizons, we had departments of Indology and Sinology, never visited by philosophers or theologians. The first great Western thinker to show intellectual hospitality to India was Immanuel Kant in his courses on geography. Foreign travel was a once-in-a-lifetime experience in those days, an experience missed by Kant, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, and Schleiermacher but not by Schopenhauer, whose rich daddy paid for him to have a tour of, Europe, of the world, of Europe, when he was young. Um, it, was, it was his armchair voyagers, relying on reports of missionaries and colonists, colonialists, that the great thinkers of the early 19th century opened up to the Orient. While this did not favor the overcoming of their Eurocentric horizon, we should admire the reach of their curiosity the tone of denunciation so often adopted by academics towards great thinkers of the past is a failure of intellectual hospitality. We, we should rejoice that they were so hospitable and so curious, instead of saying, ah, but they were Eurocentric, they were colonialist. We, we, you know, it's, it's, it's a signing off from the great adventure that they initiated. The publication of Friedrich Schlegel's Über die Sprache und Weiss at der India on the speech and wisdom of the Indian in 1808, is a landmark. Schlegel's intellectual hospitality took the form of serious study of Sanskrit from 1803, which he compared with the linguistic efforts of the Renaissance. He appended to his essay translations from Indian verse, which draw on the English versions of Charles Wilkins, and which can be faulted for imposing a European perspective by resolving in a theistic sense the ambiguities of the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is a notoriously uh, multi-perspectival document. It's very hard to reconcile its different emphasis. Interestingly, Schlegel's eldest brother, Karl August, he had another famous brother, August Wilhelm, a great um, Shakespearean scholar, and also the founder of the discipline of Indology. Anyway, Schlegel's eldest brother had died in Calcutta in 1789 in the midst of Indian studies. Um, so the, the family had a kind of personal stake in keeping up this interest in Indian studies. Next page. Schlegel wrote, as in popular history, the Asians and Europeans form only one great family, and Asia and Europe one indivisible body, we ought to contemplate the literature of all civilized peoples as this progressive development of one entire system, or as a single perfect structure. All prejudiced and narrow ideas will then unconsciously disappear. Many points will first become intelligible in their general connection, and every feature thus viewed will appear in a new light. This is 1808. Goethe is still alive, and Goethe's idea of world literature, Weltliteratur, lies in the background here. Schlegel became a Catholic, and he turned against all of this. It's one of the many reverses of this opening to, to Asia. Um, this Renaissance topless is also found in Schopenhauer in his preface to the famous Die Welt als Wille und Vorstellung, the world as will and representation, in 1818. He says, the influence of Sanskrit literature will be no less profound than that of the rediscovered Greek classics in the 15th century. Reading everything available on the Upanishads, on Vedanta, on Buddhism, he found in them the key to a total transformation of the philosophical and religious landscape. Uh, he called Anquetil du Perron's Latin translation of the Upanishads from Persian, because he didn't study Sanskrit, 
The most rewarding and elevating reading in the world, it has been the consolation of my life and will be that of my dying. Um, but Buddhists could be embarrassed by Schopenhauer's enthusiasm for again and again, he explains Buddhist concepts as in direct correspondence with his own teachings. For example, upadana attachment becomes will to life and karma becomes empirical character. Um, this is Wilhelm Halbfass. Wilhelm Halbfass was a wonderful scholar whom I was connected with oddly because his disciples, Eli Franco and Karin Pleisentanz, asked me to write for a volume in his honor, and I wrote about Heidegger and Indian philosophy, and he wrote a reply. So I'm very honored that I was found worthy of a reply. And then when he died, rather young, 60 or so, I'm not sure who it was, I, I wrote again for a commemorative volume on him. So I feel a certain affection for him, though I never met him. Um, so Schopenhauer's kind of again cannibalistic embrace of Buddhism and Hinduism may seem a defective hospitality, yet it is the warmest that Indian thought received. The very fact that a major philosopher allowed himself to become excited by Indian thought to the point of placing his entire work under its patronage outweighs the errors and misappropriations. And it's curious that Schopenhauer was taken up by the Indians and they quoted him and they even misinterpret their own religion in light of Schopenhauer. For example, I think Indira Gandhi said, Takt an Asi, that art thou. This is the Indian spirit of compassion, unity with all suffering beings, unity. And that's not what it means at all. That obviously doesn't mean that at all. But it's what Schopenhauer thought it meant. So Schopenhauer has infiltrated Indian self-understanding. Well, anyway, um, Another disappointing person in this lineup, I think, is Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche did have a, inter an interest in Buddhism. He was thinking of writing Also Sprach der Buddha, not Also Sprach Zarathustra. Thank God he didn't. Just as Wagner was thinking of writing an opera about Buddhism that would be called The, the Victors. Uh, the Victors are the Victor, their Sieger, I think. And he didn't. He wrote Parsifal instead. Zarathustra, Nietzsche Zarathustra, no doubt is a, is a travesty of Zoroastrianism, <laughs> but that hardly matters. And of course, Parsifal is a travesty of Christianity, but Christianity can take. <laughs> Whereas, it's, if the two of them had written about Buddhism, the Western reception of Buddhism would have been fatally in peril, I think. Um, <coughs> and what's sad is that one of Nietzsche's very best friends was Paul Dawson who was a true scholar of, of, of the Upanishads. His book, The Philosophy of the Upanishads, is a classic. Nietzsche's copy cut the first five or six pages. And he didn't read it. Uh, and Doyson went on to write a six-volume history of philosophy, which you can see in the library of Sophia University. First three volumes are about Asian philosophy. It covers everything. It covers even Japanese religion, like Saicho and Kukra and things like that. And the second three volumes, which he wrote when he was blind, around the time of the First World War, uh, are on Western philosophy, from the Greeks. Um, again, this is a completely unique achievement. The vast majority of histories of philosophy say that philosophy is intrinsically Greek, China and India are nothing about um, philosophy. What they call philosophy is merely wisdom, it's not philosophy. Um, what about Hegel? Surely Hegel, with his vast outlook, would have understood Chinese and Indian philosophy. Um, again, his role is ambiguous. I'll read that page 27. Hegel, whose friend Schelling had referred knowledgeably to Indian religion as early as 1802, when he was 27 years old, scoffed at the idealism of the romantics, their, their enthusiasm about India, 
stressing the non-translatability of Indian thought into European categories. Actually, on that point, Hegel shows a sensitivity to the linguistic embeddedness of thought, which could be seen as a kind of hospitality to Indian thought in the sense of respecting its otherness, refusing to reduce it to Western categories. He points out, for example, that the concept of yoga, which he defines insightfully as an absorption, fertifum, without any content, he points out that this has no adequate correlative in our languages. Here he humbly echoes the <coughs> remarks of Wilhelm von Humboldt. Um, both Humboldt and Hegel, this is the, another very famous family, his brother Alexander von Humboldt was a great linguist, I think, and explorer, I think. Anyway, both Humboldt and Hegel are beginning to understand that linguistic areas are historical epochs within the same linguistic areas, area can constitute qualitatively different intellectual worlds such that no immediate and transparent terms of understanding are available so that conversation must begin with tentative efforts to measure just how different the foreign horizon of thought is. And this brings up the whole topic of hermeneutics, which, you know, people in the 60s like Gadamer and Ricoeur uh, dwelt on Great length. And the science of hermeneutics really is born at this period in history in Schleiermacher, theological hermeneutics. Um, at least the science of hermeneutics in its modern modern form. Um, Hegel seeks, quote, to ensure that no Indian text would be admitted to the European canon because of translations that led to an involuntary mystification of it. So this is a very respectable thing for a professor in Berlin to say we, we, we must welcome Indian thought, but we must beware of distortions. That quotation comes from Bradley Herling, the German Gita, Hermeneutics and Discipline in the German Reception of Indian Thought. 1778 to 1831, hermeneutics and discipline. I mean, it, it's, it's very respectable uh, uh, as um, a policy, you know, that we, we recognize the difficulty of, of interpretation and we try to, try to ensure that the reception proceeds in a disciplined fashion. Mm -hmm. And you could fault Schopenhauer for overriding those uh, constraints um, and Hegel put his money where his mouth is because he actually wrote a long essay on the Bhagavad Gita, which I didn't know about until very recently, and which is a very fine essay. Now, he didn't read Sanskrit, and one of the problems was the Devangari script. You know, there was no Romaji, and that's a pity. It, it would have been so easy to, to, to publish it in Romaji, and, and then Hegel could have deciphered it. In any case, um, his 60-page kind of review article on Humboldt's translation uh, of the Bhagavad Gita um, is thorough, respectful, and lucidly critical. He, he, he notes the tensions. Uh, he, he notes that what later became the Sankhya philosophy is present in the Gita only in an inchoate form. In other words, he's as professional and as scholarly as he can possibly be. But for all his scholarly receptivity, Hegel is impeded by his resistance to any kind of thinking that would put the all-sufficiency of the concept in question. This resistance is clearest in his account of Neoplatonism, which magnifies the noetic aspect uh, that thinking embraces being, uh, being and thinking go together. And plays down the dimension of the one that is beyond being and that is beyond any conceptual grasp. Whenever Indian thought transcends the conceptual to apprehend ultimate reality in contemplative silence, Hegel reads it as stuck on a level of primitive abstract immediacy and as, as not yet having broken through to the conceptual level, to conceptual grasp. 
India, unlike China, he sees as capable of a certain inwardness. Quote, this idealism is present, but without concept, without reason, ruled by mere imagination, without freedom and mere dreaming, that even though it takes its beginning and material from what exists, transforms everything into the imaginary. Another grave impediment to Hegel's reception of Indian thought is this conviction that India is passive and static and that it represents a long-surpassed element no longer of value to the West. Quote, Had India transmitted a form of concrete culture, we would have to say that the Western peoples could have done nothing better than to forget this element, for they have raised themselves infinitely beyond what makes up the nature of Indian culture. Um, and yes, that is a quotation from Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of world history. Uh, a very disappointing remark. Ignorant of the thought of Shankara, he declares that Indian pantheism has not and cannot have the conceptual power of Spinoza. Spinoza. Rather, the entire stuff is dragged into the universal in a raw and immediate way. For pages on end, Hegel exhibits the logic not of Indian culture or thought, but of a prejudiced Eurocentric view of it, even to the point of accepting the slanders of the East Indian Company as the real truth about Indian culture and character. Indians are lazy, dishonest, all that kind of thing. The British, or rather the East India Company, are the masters of the land, for it is the necessary fate of Asian realms to be subjected to the Europeans. Again, who says that? Is that a direct quotation from Hegel? Yes, it is. <laughs> the British, uh, sorry, to understand the grip of Eurocentrism on his mind, we should recall that his entire system seemed to confirm a triple convergence in the history of philosophy. Sorry, a triple convergence. In the history of philosophy, Greece was the place where philosophy was born, and Germany was the land that brought it to fulfillment. In the history of religion, Christianity, especially in this reformed German form, best realize the concept of religion. Christianity is the absolute religion, according to Hegel. Why do I know that? Because I followed a course in the Gregorian as a boy with Deva Moni, and in the oral exam he asked me, according to Hegel, what is the absolute religion? And I said, well, it's the concept of representation. And the answer is, one word, Christianity. So, <laughs> trick question, if you like. Anyway, um, In history as such, the world spirit moved from east to west and is now borne by Europe, notably by the British Parliament and the Prussian state. Perhaps philosophers cannot overcome this Eurocentrism even today, except by letting their thinking be fed and challenged by non-European sources. So when philosophers say, I have no time to study Buddhism, or I can't be reading these Chinese texts and translation them, they're really refusing to take the medicine against your centers. Mm -hmm. Hegel was misled by the old missionary anecdote to the effect that at the point of death, the Buddha confessed that his entire teaching masked an atheistic nihilism. This was taken up by Joseph de Gagne in his Histoire Générale des Indes de Mongols de Turc, uh, which was republished in 1828 to 1830, influencing the 1830 lectures on the philosophy of religion. And Hegel could have known better than that because his other sources, for example, Colebrook, had corrected that. An English travel report published in Leipzig in 1750 is another source for Hegel's view of Buddhism as a religion of nothing. From nothing we are told that everything proceed, to nothing does everything go back. And again, his quote, that's, that's, that's from Hegel, uh, relying on that traveler's report. <clears throat> um, here the Mahayana doctrine of emptiness is reduced to a crude metaphysics of nothingness. But Hegel could not know this, and Nagarjuna would not be accessible in German until 1911. Anyway, this frightening vision of Buddhism greatly dampened European enthusiasm for Indian thought. As Roger Paul puts it, hope gave way to fright, dream to nightmare, 
India as paradise to Asia as hell. The pact that was believed to have been sealed between East and West, found in this Oriental Renaissance, was broken by Buddhism. When people realized that Buddhism was a nihilism, they just stepped back in shock, horror, and consternation. Hegel introduces the notions of God and pantheism into the Buddhist religion, prompted by polemics of the time against Schleiermacher in his 1824 lectures and against accusations of pantheism in 1827. There are four sets of lectures, four different dates. Though his principal source, Kohlbrook, brought him to see that India had developed real philosophies, this insight was not allowed to destabilize his view of the history of philosophy nor was it taken up by historians of philosophy who ritually repeated the declaration that philosophy was unique to the Greeks. We must give Hegel credit for his desire to know the world empirically and his refusal to make an ivory tower of the concept. His rewriting and rethinking of the philosophy of religion in his four lecture courses might indicate the beginnings of a breakdown as the superb machinery of his science of logic proved increasingly irrelevant to the different logics that he seemed to discern in each exposition of the historical sequence of religions. His changing estimations of Indian religion indicate as as Herling says, that the essentialization of difference within the Hegelian system of cross-cultural understanding was not as fixed as some have supposed. Had he lived longer, he was carried off by the typhus and cholera, cholera, typhus, are they the same thing? Anyway, at the age of 60. Had he lived longer, he might have found that no arrangement of the religions and logical sequence could accommodate the great plurality of religious perspectives. He might then have come to appreciate the relativist currents in India, which even in Vedic times had harbored the thought that, quote, there cannot be a religious or philosophical doctrine valid for all people and for all times. I think that's von Helmut von Blasenheim, <coughs> whom I think quite a lot in this essay, <coughs> German Buddhist scholar. So all in all, Hegel is a kind of a hero because he did make an effort to open up to India. You know, he, he, he had, I think, more, more of an affinity with India than with China. Like Goethe, he found China, China very dry and very, very dull, not lacking the inwardness that he saw in India. And Heidegger, I would also see as a hero, though many people talk about Heidegger as a German, Germano, Greco-Germanic imperialist who was totally dismissive of foreign traditions. This is not really true. Page um, 30, Heidegger's reluctance to talk of texts that he could not read in the original language is a mark of academic distinction. It's in the same line as Hegel. You know, we must be very cautious because we don't know the language. He would have seen little point in Karl Jasper's encyclopedic coverage of the Buddha and the Gardner and Lao Tzu which seems to rely on a hermeneutically naive belief in some universal intertranslatability of philosophical systems. Heidegger did find some inspiration or confirmation in D.T. Suzuki and in writers on Taoism, but he made no effort to absorb them imperialistically as hidden sources. This title of English translation of Reinhard May's book, Heidegger's Hidden Sources, I think it's a distortion. Um, his one published exercise in dialogue with the East is mainly concerned with explaining his own thought to the Japanese interlocutor and Professor Tezuka of Toda, who was a Germanist. But the Japanese uh, does have an opportunity to expound some suggested Japanese notions, discussing the characters that correspond to form and emptiness in the Heart Sutra, uh, Iro and Ku. The Japanese explains, Iro means more than color and everything of that sort that the senses perceive. Ku, the open, the emptiness of the sky, means more than the supersensible. 
So a phenomenology that undercuts the Platonic schema that exalts the supersensible over the sensible could not but please Heidegger, who seems more interested in a Japanese immanentist sense of worldhood than in Buddhist emptiness. He does not know of Zen master Dogen's description of language as flowers of emptiness, but he is pleased by an etymology of kotoba as meaning petals that come from the thing, from the koto, or from Heidegger would think the zahde, the zahde, the speech as the revelation of being. He identifies the thing as beings and their being. The brief exposure to Japanese language leads him to conclude Quote, if humans through their language dwell in the claim of being, are claimed by being through their language, then we Europeans probably dwell in a quite different house from the people of East Asia. Now this might imply that being is something more than what the West apprehends and addresses humanity also mm -hmm. through the key words of other civilizations. It's a little bit like Catholic Church saying, the divine word addresses Hindus and Buddhists also. We, we can't really figure out what it says to them. We know what it says to us in, 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 in the Bible and in Christ. Um, perhaps it pushed further. Heidegger might be ready to admit that the word being itself and the very scenario of its claim and address are constructions of Western philosophy or of his own philosophy, not necessarily applicable to the concerns of Asian thought. Given how respectfully Heidegger spoke, how respectfully Heidegger spoke of the other great beginnings, he saw Greece as a great beginning, but he also saw Hebrew, Hebrew Bible as a great beginning. You know, the idea that he was so anti-Jewish that he couldn't respect the Bible is, is, I think, very false. He didn't study it. He knew the New Testament and he was a friend of Bultmann. He didn't, he didn't know much about Jewish. Bible, but he would not put it down. His, his ecumenism of great beginnings is kind of basic to his outlook. So we can interpret his stance as a hospitable one, putting the stress not on utterances that suggest a Greek or German chauvinism and echo the received idea that philosophy existed only in Greece, but on the modesty of the way he cites the Greek question of being as just one of these great beginnings. This question in its particular Greek form lacks any obvious correlative in Indian or Chinese thought. That's my claim that I wrote about in a half-past volume that he replied to. Um, of course, India does talk about being in, in Sanskrit as being as one. It doesn't have the Greek question of being. At least that's, that was my claim. There is a tendency among Christian thinkers today to see Heidegger's concern with the truth of being as intrinsically pagan and anti-Christian. Um, this kind of radical orthodoxy, sort of Augustinian pessimism, wants to see all modern thinkers as nihilists of some kind. Um, which is very different from the attitude of Christian theologians to Heidegger back in the 1950s, when they saw him as a fellow traveler, a kind of a, a, an empathy between Heidegger and a Protestant and Catholic theologian, like Bernhard Welter, who presided at his funeral, like Johannes Baptist Lotz, Thomist, who was very friendly with Heidegger, uh, and like um, Heinrich Ott, many other. Um, Lutheran and Presbyterian Calvinist theologians. Um, the Heideggerian question of being and the Hegelian concept could serve as platforms for a powerful philosophical dialogue with Asia. We need to open both of them up a bit more. If we build on the hospitality on the hosp hospitable dynamics of both, on their open, interrogative, self-revising character. Never forget that Hegel wanted to rewrite his logic 50 times. He only had time to rewrite a 
the first part of it once, <laughs> but he would have liked to rewrite it 50 times because he knew that the material was so complex and so, so open to constant rethinking. Um, Hegel, challenges, Hegel challenges us to recognize the power of reason at work in Asian philosophy, while Heidegger attunes us to their phenomenological dimension which may turn out to be very remote from the Greek fascination of being, just as the concepts of Asian philosophy are quite subversive in their impact on Western philosophy. We saw that last week with non-duality and the week before with emptiness. Well, um, I leave Rana there because that's you're probably familiar with Catholic dealings with Eastern religion. Questions, please? Thoughts? Actually, I have a lot of questions, oh. uh, but not very uh, determinate in my mind yet, so maybe we can just pick something and talk about it. Um, first thing that came to my mind is the re recent translations of uh, English translation of Hegel's uh, lectures on history, philosophy of world history. Yes. Peter Hodgson yes. translated. Yes. Um, and he does a great job, but one of the really interesting things he does in the footnotes mm -hmm. is to show what he was reading at the time. Ah, that's very good. So yeah. some of the comments look ridiculous from yeah. our perspective, yeah. but he yeah. puts the footnotes and yeah. says, yeah. these are not his original comments. Yeah. It comes yeah. from some of the texts that are yeah. available at the time. Yeah. Um, so maybe we can go back to some mm -hmm. of the texts where, what was what were the consensus at the time? So mm -hmm. Maybe it was not just Hegel's. Mm -hmm. You know, individual crime mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. um, you know East, but it was yeah. just commonly thought to be that way. Well, I, I think you're right, and I, I, I would never attack Hegel right. as an individual because I think he was a very honest mm -hmm. man. He was doing the very best he could. Yeah. Um, so maybe the responsibility is not on him, but yeah. more of the um, scholars that actually explained to him that this, this is what we found in, mm -hmm. in Asia. Yeah, yeah. true. Except in one or two cases, he had, he had better sources than the ones he drew on. You know, he had okay. yeah, he used the sources a bit better. But, but um, uh, that's why I say he's a hero because he did a lot. You know, considering that he needn't have, he needn't have written sixty pages of the Bhagavad Gita. So he was aware that there was something there to be taught. He wasn't self-enclosed. You know? But then this was an amazing generation. I think. An awful lot of them were open to, to the East, you know, at least wanted to be open to the East. Um, uh, I think Friedrich Schlegel is the most disappointing. I mean, Thomas Emos loved the later Schlegel, who became a Catholic. But I thought that that was such a disappointment, especially his whole family, the three of the three brothers had given their lives, if you like, to India, and then they decided at least. Friedrich was perhaps the most brilliant of the three decides to, to go back into a Catholic main mm -hmm. which is of course following the trend of the time, the Catholic yeah. revival, the restorationist period. That probably had a big effect in, in dampening the Oriental Renaissance. Yeah. Because people were very enthusiastic for India in the 1810s or so, the 1800s, and there was the high point of romanticism, of idealism, of all these things. But there's a huge change of atmosphere, you know, with the death of Hegel, 1831, with the, 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 the end of the Napoleonic realm and the restoration of, of Catholic monarchs all over the Europe, and Protestant monarchs, too. Um, and with um, uh, the kind of deflation of Romanticism. You know, even Schelling becomes very Catholic in his later writings. True, he still talks about mythology and so on, but mm. uh, it's uh, it's in Munich, mm -hmm. Catholic headquarters. You know? uh, another thing, maybe just um, addition to that argument, uh, sort of um, what was it? Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and I was thinking about also like Heidegger and Cory Aspers. Yes, a lot of people use Cory Aspers saying that he has. Axial age, yeah. therefore he's more open to yeah, I know. decent yeah. thought. And yeah. Heidegger has this uh, yes. one sentence saying that philosophy is uh, 
uh, occidental thinking, therefore there's no such thing as philosophy outside of West. Yes. But if you contextualize yeah, yeah, yeah. the philosophy, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to use Heidegger for uh, Eastern thinking or dialogue with Eastern mm -hmm. thinking than in Horus or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so maybe we, we would have to distinguish between this sort of literal embracement of saying mm -hmm. that there's philosophy mm -hmm. outside of West to yeah. the actual mm -hmm. systematic framework mm -hmm. that they use that we can use for inter intercultural philosophy or um, so we can yeah, even suspend the judgment that this guy is anti-Semitic but mm -hmm. the framework that he provides mm -hmm. is far more mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. capable of articulating something beyond mm -hmm. his personal mm -hmm. comment about all this. Well, I agree with you totally. And uh, of course, Heidegger does need to be saved from himself, I mean, the limits of his personality and his mindset. But he gives plenty of leads for doing that, you know. His, his philosophy has plenty of openings, you know. Um, Jasper's, the trouble Jasper's is very encyclopedic, and it's also not very good. I mean, I, I haven't read him very carefully, but the, the critics say that his account in the Guardian so is out of date, mm -hmm. and it's really published it. Um, but again, I, I don't know Jasper's thought, really. And no. I think it also opens up perspectives, not, not, not the kind of encyclopedic stuff, but the whole thinking about, you know, the, the way he reaches out to, to being in his own way, a very different way from my person. No. Um, well, what, do you, what do you think is the best format in which Western and non-Western philosophy can be? Dialogue. For instance, Hegel is sort of absorbing an entire mm -hmm. moment mm -hmm. sphere, mm -hmm. and you said Nietzsche or Schopenhauer mm -hmm. is more like just talking about mm -hmm. themselves by using mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a dialogue, but it's a monologue mm -hmm. using mm -hmm. other framework. Mm -hmm. And Corey Asper's encyclopedic thought mm -hmm. might be, he might even argue that, so well, I'm just letting each tradition speak for itself yeah. and just yeah. cataloging. Yeah. Yeah. But you're saying that none of those are sufficient form of. This is a very good question. Yeah. What is the best format? The best format, it applies for theology as well. What's the best format for Christian Buddhist theology? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a very basic question, because if you look at any discussion of Christian Buddhist uh, theology or of Western Buddhist philosophy, I think you can ask the question, is the format itself adequate? Or, you know, it is, it's, 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 it's probably quite a disturbing question. I mean, once you get outside strict Buddhology, which is just expounding in a scholarly way what the Buddhists, what the Buddhists said, you're into, immediately, you're into very tricky waters. You know, I was recommending uh, T.R.V. Murti, his book on Nagarjuna, the central philosophy of Buddhism. I think it's a very important book, but it's obvious that he's in deep waters and he's floundering a bit because he talks about Kant and Hegel and Bradley and Vedanta and is illuminating the garden from all these angles. Um, this is an Indian now, writing about an Indian thinker, but again, the hermeneutics. Isn't he, isn't he in great danger of, of, of not letting the garden speak because he's, he's reading him in light of all these other perspectives? Any more thoughts on yeah, that form of question? <laughs> so many questions. <laughs> Um, yeah. um, you, you, you opened your comments by saying that you thought that the dialogue between Buddhists and Christians became derailed by sectarianism. So mm -hmm. you know, let's have a look at philosophy and see if it did any better. Mm -hmm. Went through the, a brief history and was kind of on another mm -hmm. pole. Mm -hmm. You made reference to Goethe's um, world philosophy. World literature. Yeah. Uh, world literature. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe yeah. something yeah. similar to that. Yeah. Well, Maybe if, I, if I look well. at, the, at the two things, the dialogue between Buddhists and Christianity, or Christianity and other religions, and the dialogue between philosophies in East and West, you know, at least in the course of my own lifetime, these were carried out by explorers. I mean, young people <coughs> who wanted an adventure of ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It wasn't carried out or, or done by, by experts so much. Now, if you look at the first um, Buddhist Christian dialogues, you had people like John Cobb, you know, who was really at the center. You had some um, uh, 
helpless people like Hans Kuhn, who was constantly instructing mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. you know, the rules about what they should think and what they mm -hmm. shouldn't think. But in general, you have you have people giving it authority, mm -hmm. giving it um, you know respectability, like John Tom. But they were giving respectability to a whole generation of young people that were just yeah. interested in yeah. trying these things out and experimenting with things. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? Well, then it, it became an academic specialization. Mm -hmm. And you've got people writing about how it should be done, and what mm -hmm. the rules it should be done, mm -hmm. what the preparations mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. it then became uninteresting. So mm -hmm. I think the reason it died is, mm -hmm. is not because of religious sectarianism, mm -hmm. but it simply became uninteresting. Mm -hmm. Because from the very beginning, uh, religions were not mm -hmm. supportive of this. Mm -hmm. There's no major religious association of uh, institution that got behind, you know, solid intellectual dialogue. Not even the Vatican no, uh, no. Secretariat? No. Mm -hmm. no. There was nobody that was behind it. There, yeah. there, was, yeah. there were tea parties and yeah. there were mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. hostilities mm -hmm. were ceased for a short yeah. while. Mm -hmm. But there was nothing. Yeah. And it was these academics who were interested. And then, mm -hmm. as as academics took over, then, then the existing uh, divisions I say, took to control. So in mm -hmm. Japan, you have the Intetsu, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Buddhist philosophy, mm -hmm. which are textual. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have the philosophers mm -hmm. who use Buddhism as a rational way. And they don't talk to each other at all. Mm -hmm. They never have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was eventually, um, when these people got drawn into the dialogue, they just throw cold water in it. Mm -hmm. So my question goes back, I mean, I don't want to go to the whole history here, and I don't mm -hmm. know as much about it as you do, but my question goes back to this. What's the, the purpose of this um, meaning of East and Western philosophy? Now, from the West, oh yeah, of course, we have to turn back this idea that we can write a logic about all, where all the religions of the world and philosophies of the world fit in. Uh, we have to be a little more humble. We have to open ourselves to other ways. Well, the fact is, there's no counterpart for that in Asia. I mean, there are some new cults and movies and so forth that want to you know, unify the world. But as far as a philosophical vision, like a Hegel or a Heidegger, mm -hmm. that says that the, the real philosophy is done in Asia, mm -hmm. the Western is just a pale reflection, it's a good thing we weren't taken over by them, this is, that, that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So. The big questions cannot be a question that was generated just in the West. And the same thing I would say for the, the Buddhist Christian dialogue. What's going to bring it back to life mm -hmm. is not overcoming sectarianism. It's always going to be a fringe activity. Mm -hmm. That's okay. It's going to bring it back to life if there are more interesting questions. Yeah, on the table. yeah. that's the point. And so perhaps even in philosophy, the most interesting yeah. question for Asia yeah. is not what's wrong with Western universalism. Mm -hmm. It's not really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's it's, a, it's mm -hmm. absolutely essential for mm -hmm. us because mm -hmm. you're talking about Western hospitality, mm -hmm. Eastern thought. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So it may be that the very foundation of the question is that we have to take a more big, a bigger mm -hmm. attitude. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting <laughs> question. They're unpredictable by definition. Yeah. And they, they, as you say, they, they can't be scheduled in advance according to some massive mm -hmm. project, you know. And maybe that's a big mistake that uh, our whole way of thinking the Catholic Church about interreligious dialogue, it's a massive project. Vatican II gave the order, and now the yeah. troops go forth to do it. Exactly. But it's not quite like that that things work out in real life. You, you mentioned Cobb and Hick, and who's the man in, in Manchester University? You know what I mean? Lancaster. Works in he also began, all three of them began as kind of stuffy philosophers of religion, and then they suddenly took a turn east and became uh -huh. exciting uh, people of dialect. Very famous, by the way. Very well known name. <clears throat> Not a British, all three are British as well, which is interesting. But um, the format question, in fact, is possibly a misleading question because these interesting questions create their own format, right? Mm -hmm. And you said explorers rather than experts, but in our own mm -hmm. memory here, we have Jan van Bracht, we have Jan Zwingedow. These are people who who are who are the typical explorers. And I, think I, yes. I mean, it's a very bad thing to say, but they went native in a sense. You know, they remained, of course, uh, uh, 
<coughs> Catholic missionaries, but they still went much farther than most. And these are the people who keep it alive. How many Buddhists, how many, how many Japanese have done that? I was trying to think there, many Japanese who have done the same thing, you know? The I mean, was, in, in sorry? In, in Japan, I mean... They went to the West. No, no, uh, they went to Japanese, the Japanese Christians who went to Japanese Buddhism. Oh, the I way see, young I, see, and yeah. I mean, there must be many, but... Mm. I can't think of any at the moment, you know? But, there are Japanese masters of Zen, like Katawaki and Oshida, is it? Hanok. Uh, Who's that? Hanok. Hanok is that? Hanok, she was in a Protestant pastor. Yes. Yeah, good, okay. Okay. Uh, right. Um, well, so yeah, okay. I actually listened to both the comments. I thought the three things I thought about that come from completely different backgrounds, which is my, my raw impression. The three things I thought about the context, mm -hmm. uh, the sources that the people use, and also the motivations, which I think is mm -hmm. a different way of saying what Jim was saying. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested in that. Like what the con so the context that Hegel and um, uh, yeah, what you were talking about. Of course, mm -hmm. it's, it's different, and the sources that they will be using are different. Mm -hmm. So, if you, if you I'm, I'm not sure if you're comparing, or you, you're looking back at the past as a way of saying, well, these guys were uh, exploring, mm -hmm. um, trying to develop some sort of, I don't know about if you want to use the word dialogue, but mm -hmm. they were motivated by something. And I'm just wondering what the motivations are. It's, it's really kind of a similar thing. What Saying like, what, why would why would people be motivated to do it? Why were they motivated then? What motivates people to, to do it now? What can they get out of it now? What's their aim? Of it? You mentioned the purpose. It kind of it really that's what I really thought when I was listening to it. I just wondered. Well, of course, my paper is very much subscribing to the ideal of an Oriental Renaissance, right? right, that, right, right. that that Buddhism and Hinduism would mean to the West what Greek and Latin classics meant to the West in the first Renaissance. Yeah. But, but, uh, but no that might be romantic, I pre sorry. <laughs> well, no one speaks for the West. I'm just trying to get the individual you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. you can talk about Western thought, I think you can, yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's not if if you if if, if you got I, I tend to think you've got to get to specifics of the people and why they mm -hmm. do the sort of things mm -hmm. that they do. Mm -hmm. Um if uh why I was interested why would Hegel why was he looking at that in, in this particular light? Mm -hmm. uh, why would anyone look at so I'm just I think the motivation question is something that is is mm -hmm. kind of key to it, in my sense. I mean, mm -hmm. a framework can only be useful if people are going to get something out of it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I mean that was, it's just a, mm -hmm. it's, it's really mm -hmm. similar, or maybe not. Well, <laughs> yeah. it's true. It, what, what was bugging Hegel? I mean, he, he, towards the end of his life, he spent an awful lot of time doing research on the history of religion, you know, concrete research. What was he looking for? You know, I mean, had he it all wrapped up already? Did he need to do further research? But there was something bugging him. You know? Yeah. Um, um, but with Hegel, it's never just individual. It's 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 mm -hmm. the system as well. Like the system kind of prescribes that you mm -hmm. must now study this. It's necessary to study this. It's like it's like somebody in a big factory has to. Make sure that our nuclear nuclear plant is make sure that each of the reactors is being looked after and is being upgraded and so on. Um, but you, you're, this is an important question because your Renaissance is the West can learn all these things and mm -hmm. revitalize mm -hmm. the West. Just as we, we got this uh, mm -hmm. Greek philosophy that revitalized what Paul was trying to do in the Gospel of mm -hmm. yeah. But the point is, if you had Greek philosophers dialoguing with first century theologians, they wouldn't have got out at all. Mm. And so what do you mean? No, no, you have to take it in context. That's not what we mean at all. Well, That's not our idea. They know that they didn't get out. I mean, Celsus, yeah, you know, yeah. the wonderful fellow who attacked Christianity very cleverly, very sharply, and then Porphyry, who was thousands of years ahead of, 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 of the biblical scholarship. Yes. I mean, he, he took the prophecies of Daniel, and he said, well, of course, these prophecies are it's adventure. It's obvious that Daniel knew this, 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 and this. And whoever wrote this book, that the events didn't happen when they're supposed to have happened, they happened long after. And 
This is one part of the squad that survived because they're so clever, you know. Yeah, and do you want, is that what you're trying to do, is get more people to dialogue with the other mm -hmm. and take what they can, both sides can take, or mm -hmm. are you interested in reviving the West? Um, well, in theory, it's too long, as you know, Christianity and, and, and Asia is too long as of humanity. You know, I quoted some of who said that, and I quoted that just a second yeah, ago, but who exactly said it, I forgot. Yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah, Friedrich yeah. Schlegel, maybe. Yeah, there's a friend yeah. Uh, the French guy, Michelet, uh, only a Frenchman. <laughs> uh, but but, uh, but Michelet was a historian. For who? Yeah. Well, uh, what does he say exactly? Um, he was realizing the human race with Buddhism and Christianity functioning as its two spiritual lungs. But he was a historian of immense, yeah. immense region of the history of, of, of France and history of, and mostly the history of France, yes, but covering the entire history of France. So obviously, like many of these 19th century people, they had a kind of cosmic ambition. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I, I mean, the 19th century was the century of imperialism, right? But I think that these thinkers were beyond imperialism. What they wanted was a world, a world empire that wouldn't be a European empire. It would be the empire of humanity. It would be, they had a kind of religion of humanity. And um, um, this, this lasted until, until the end of the 19th century, this ambition to, to, to have a, a world civilization. I think the world, First World War probably put things back in order because people won't get to think in those lofty ways anymore. Um, but today, we are already living in a global world, so if we don't take interest in each other's traditions, it's not just that we're showing a lack of culture and a lack of hospitality and a lack of humanity. Yeah. It's also that we're sowing the seeds of future conflict. I mean, I was very shocked to read in Bernard Seneca's essay in that book that Cyril Veliat edited, that in Korea, Catholic priests will not study Buddhism because they feel they'll have no job. The bishops suspect their motives if they start studying Buddhism. Same is true of Protestant pastors. And the Buddhist monks sometimes will not allow Christians to study Buddhism because they might use it, misuse it, to attack Buddhism. So this spirit of mistrust, I mean. So it's not so much a cosmic Renaissance vision so much now as a globalized culture, dialogue, interaction, mutual fertilization. So in some ways, if you open yourself up to that tradition, it's almost like succeeding that way. Right? The fact that they are not expanding themselves to that or mm -hmm. you yeah. know, paying attention is just because they're being sectarian toward themselves and you know, they, they're kind of dying inside. Well, they're dying from lack of dialogue. I mean, the, the, yeah. the, 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 the obsession with identity. You know, look at Japanese Christianity, it's in decline. Yeah. Indigenous Japanese Christianity is going down. There's a lack of zeal. And it's not surprising because they've been having such a stale diet, recycling European debates over and over again. If they'd opened up to their own local traditions, they might have discovered a much happier kind of Christianity, as people like Van Brat did, you know, the, the, the joyful, friendly exchange between Christians and Buddhists. So, the medicine, it's medicine really. The dialogue is a medicine. You know. What would be preferable for you, for example, in theological schools around the world, courses in Buddhist thought, Zoroastrian, or whatever, were taught to people? Or that there's always a small fringe of theologians who are reading these things, and but they're good theologians, and the people read them and get. Inspired to them. Oh, that's interesting. And then they rethink their own thought without mm -hmm. ever de delving deeply into it themselves. Mm -hmm. So, shouldn't it be a fringe um, activity that mm -hmm. isn't taken over by academia with mm -hmm. departments and PhDs yeah. and programs yeah. and titles yeah. and everything, mm -hmm. which then feeds the whole? Or mm -hmm. should it be, well, everybody around the world should study, all the theologians should study a little Buddhism? The Buddhist schools should study a little yeah. Buddhism. Yeah. I'm yeah, sure, which is I can easily imagine having a world philosophy series, and you know they're starting so as mm -hmm. the whole format they they make world philosophy series 
uh, courses in BA could easily turn into uh, just philosophy courses in Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, everyone goes through the same program, read the same text, mm -hmm. and recycling the same idea, never asking why we're asking this question in the first place, yeah. and turning into uh, different dogma. Mm -hmm. It's just the same, yeah. uh, the same, same uh, outcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is that, we you going for um, the small uh, pockets of fringe? So, uh, 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 no, 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 yeah. if you want people to be fair and to cover the whole field of yeah. philosophy or religion, mm -hmm. then you say, well, you have to have courses in world religions and other philosophies. Yeah. Yeah. But if um, the idea is just to, to uh, stimulate them, mm -hmm. To, to open this to, to other ideas when they come in. People really need to go. Well, um, I remember how liberation theology was regarded in the University of Notre Dame. They talked about the liberation methodology. Yeah. In other words, they killed. They acad acad yeah, acad 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 academicized it and killed it. Mm -hmm. And of course, that can happen to anything. You know, so if, if the motivation is a mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. about how do we make theology a world theology, Mm -hmm. and philosophy or world mm -hmm. philosophy, mm -hmm. then you're going to end up with these programs and these books. And so mm -hmm. But if it's a real living question, mm -hmm. like how do we stop war, or mm -hmm. what do you do to save the planet, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, then there's no way my own resources are enough. And there's going to be many <coughs> people who work with both of them. Yeah. There's going to be some that specialize in one and some in the other. But the forum, the question that mm -hmm. makes it all worthwhile, is bigger than any of these traditions or their own locally generated problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but don't forget that Buddhism is an extremely vast and learned tradition. And you have to have institutes like, like this one. Yeah. You have to have libraries. Yes. Uh, the Bunkyo Kuhn, the Yukai Library in, 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 in Tokyo, it's a wonderful resource. And whenever I go there, and yes. some two other people there, yeah. four floors of incredible books. But there's the community, there's, there's a tiny group of students and a tiny group of professors, about 12 professors and 12 students. You mean the Reiyukai? The Reiyukai place, yeah. yeah. It's an amazing oh, treasure. Yeah. 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 But I'm talking about the dialogue, you know, yeah. 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 the dialogue. Should yeah. be something that everybody goes through as a matter of training when they become a specialist? Or is it something that the question demands it, you enter into it and you retreat to your specialization? Yeah. Because there are two different questions about how yes. do we make uh, a world philosophy and then how do we get different traditions of that world. Yeah. And mm -hmm. trying to absorb them both together only works in abstract level in academia, yeah. making yeah. careers and things. So it doesn't yeah. really work to solve problems. Yeah. So where does this dialogue happen? I mean, I mean, I don't just mean people collaborating, for example, in response to 9 11 or to 3 11. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, the li in the library, they had a moment of silence. Did you? Yeah, 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 we, we had that. a very touching yeah. thing. But um, it, it's not just that sometimes Buddhists and Christians are thrown together in response <coughs> to a concrete need, you know, which is wonderful, of course. But, but the philosophical dialogue, how, where does that happen? See, it, it, I mean, it, it does happen, it happens in. in Tokyo Buddhist discussion group that we take part in, which happens in, at the International Association for Buddhist Studies, a vast gathering of people. There were, uh, there were elements of East West philosophical dialogue in that. You know, but the thing is, if you're talking about doing comparison, mm -hmm. so the academic conferences, mm -hmm. I want to compare mm -hmm. Shankara mm -hmm. to Eckhart. Yeah, but so it's not I, just comparison, it's, it's intricate. But and then you have uh, experts in both fields talking mm -hmm. about yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. But you know, I've, I've mm -hmm. always thought that dialogue is a little bit different. It's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you leave your guns at the door mm -hmm. when you walk in. Mm -hmm. And I come in not as someone representing Christianity mm -hmm. or representing whatever, Sigillian thought an argogenous thought or whatever. So we don't come mm -hmm. in as a specialist mm -hmm. and ask questions and mm -hmm. say, well, what do you think? And mm -hmm. that, that's an academic discussion, mm -hmm. comparative discussion. What I'm talking about is you leave your specializations, no, your ability to represent a tradition mm -hmm. in the door. Mm -hmm. And you come in and you say, well, you, you talk as one who has been raised 
in the tradition you were raised in. You know? So you don't say, well, what does Islam think about this? No, I don't represent Islam, but mm -hmm. anyone raised in the Islamic mm -hmm. tradition, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, and however that raising made any difference, I would say we should do this. And so then you're having a discussion without asking, why do you say what you say? What is the background in your tradition? Do you really represent the whole of your tradition? No, not as representatives of tradition, but as human individuals who were raised in a certain tradition, and out of that they speak. Yes. Without having to say, why do you yes. say that and not yes. what he says? No, no, let's talk about the problem. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in a dialogue, in a sense, mm -hmm. you are not representing an academic specialization mm -hmm. or a religious faith. Mm -hmm. You're a human being who, for mm -hmm. better or for worse, was raised mm -hmm. with this tradition, and that here's what I have to say. Mm -hmm. from that. Um, right. So it looks like there's two kinds of dialogue. Because at the AAR now, there's two panels that hopefully will be accepted. One is on divine presence in different traditions, and Francis Grunley will be the respondent to that. And the other is on paradox in Buddhist philosophy, and Stephen Heine, I think, will be the respondent to that. And these are kind of intellectual, delightful discussions, with each with different emphasis. And it's not really based on their religious affiliation at all, it's just they pick up the topic, uh, an, an aspect of the topic. And I, I'm not even, I don't think they even think of what religion they're speaking about. Because I speak of a Buddhist text, another one speaks of Jonathan Cross. Um, so it's not, this is not the kind of dialogue where people are representing anything. But neither is it the kind of dialogue that you are suggesting of, kind of sharing a concern, a, a concrete mm -hmm. concern. There is a concern of divine presence. Oh, well, that's okay. That's okay. Even mm -hmm. an academic topic. Yeah. But it seems like if Jim's model is, you know, interreligious style, you would have to create some new context. You know, instead of the one religion is talking about itself in its own context to talk to someone else about the questions that they're sharing, you would have to create different environments really uh, to do it. But my question again is like when theologians talking about Buddhism. And talking about Buddhist ideas, you know, this is Nishtanin's criticism about theologians talking about Buddhism. It, it looks like they are reaching out to their mm -hmm. different concepts, mm -hmm. but it's actually reinforcing their own yes. language. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they don't, use the words. But, but say, those are the theologians of that time, of course. <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, but when we measure that, okay, this is a dialogue, it's a genuine dialogue mm -hmm. that both of them are reaching out to mm -hmm. know more about themselves in the world, yeah. whatever, yeah. to. Yeah. You know, it looks like dialogue, but in, in fact, one side is just kind of reinforcing their closure. Uh, you know, so it's like a half hospitality, right? That they right, kind of but I, I don't think that's, that's necessarily the case because, um, I mean, if, if a Christian theologian is in dialogue with Buddhism, that means his or her own thought is being changed all the time. Yes. It's, it's mm -hmm. undergoing a process of change. Okay. So in the end, you don't have two sides. You have so it's the community. something that's going on. Um, but you have lots of opinions about, about the world and about you know, metaphysical questions mm -hmm. and ethical questions. And if somebody were to say, well, does that come from Buddhism or from Christianity? Mm -hmm. so, uh, I don't know, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, <laughs> because you've been carrying this on. And those are yeah. the most important things you say, yeah. not yeah. The, the answering that question yeah. of where did it come from. Yeah. Because that's, yeah. you know, yeah. But that you actually yeah. got there. Yeah. That's what's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So like when Ben was talking, I could say, well, this interest in motivation is being central. Does that come from the Buddhist background? You could say, well, I don't know. So that's not the important, important question. Like, the question is important. The belief, I think, people's, uh, what people do, what people believe in is kind of uh, manifested in what they do, or their actions. You, but you can judge their beliefs to a certain extent by the actions they take. I think. And so I'm thinking, as you know, I'm thinking about the things that, if you want, if bringing people together at a table. So, so this current, the, the forthcoming issue of Asian ethnology is called Salvage and Salvation. So it's all about religious groups' responses to disaster in Asia. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's the there's 311, and then um, the the um, east uh, the, the the tsunami in 2004 uh, in Sri Lanka and all that. And so mm -hmm. the there's like discussion within that about actions of different groups and, and people coming together and discussing. And it's not, not this is our tradition, this is how we do it. We're actually in the middle of this mud mm -hmm. and 
this is what we're doing mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I just think that when when there's when there's something that actually involves an action mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than rather than a um, uh, just a discussion about ideas, mm -hmm. which may or may not be put into action, mm -hmm. and, and all those ideas too. Everything, I mean, everything that we filter as mm -hmm. humans, mm -hmm. we may we may get the, the great idea from the text or from uh, from the, the person who we admire, who is also who stands for that tradition. Mm -hmm. But our own actions may not actually represent that, and sometimes we don't necessarily want to be represented by that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, when just. To my, my thinking, I mean, I, I just feel that by, by focusing on specific events where, that involve human activity mm -hmm. from diff people of different cultures, mm -hmm. and it could mean anything, um, mm -hmm. uh, just a community meeting or something like that. Mm -hmm. Those things are those are things where people where, where the beliefs and the motivations really come out. And I, I agree with you. And what's more, if you don't have the praxis element, your theology is withers away and becomes a kind of a dry uh, recycling of the same set of problems over and over again. You absolutely need the, something like that to, to, mm. to, to shake you out of that. So I'm wondering what happened like with, with the beginning of this interreligious dialogue, were, were, were there events, I mean, this is a so were there, there were events of, of the time that people started to believe, like, this is a problem that we can, these are problems that we can actually resolve or issues that we can deal with. And, um, or the, the need, the need to have some serious thought about how we came together and what we, what we think for the future. Because so, I mean, it's the issues that we're facing these days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trump. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> um, <laughs> but more important than Trump is the, the question of ecology, and I'm wondering mm -hmm. how much Buddhism and Christianity were involved together in the early awakening of ecological mm -hmm. awareness. I imagine there must have been a lot. And what he was just saying, what I was just saying, was kind of the, the history of the religious choice went. At the beginning, um, you get Buddhists and Christians talking about doctrine, different doctrines, and they were actually at the same table, and they weren't fighting, mm -hmm. and they were drinking together. This was amazing. Mm -hmm. And they were all academics, and they were publishing books together. Mm -hmm. you know? And then, after about eight or ten symposia like this, mm -hmm. um, we began to say, well, you know, what, um, what Who's, who's making the questions? I mean, they're all mm -hmm. coming out of doctrine. Doctrine mm -hmm. is much more mm -hmm. central in Christianity than mm -hmm. it is in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So we had the thing with Sokogakai where the praxis became kind of the mm -hmm. center. And all, after that, all the discussions, all the symposia were no longer Zen in Christianity, pure land in Christianity, Shinto. The whole focus changed, mm -hmm. and they turned to real problems. And the first mm -hmm. real problem was cults. Mm -hmm. And we had a lawyer in there, which is really mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he was Buddhist or Christian or mm -hmm. any religion, mm -hmm. but his comments were mm -hmm. very interesting mm -hmm. about how to deprogram people mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and what religion should do in relation mm -hmm. to this. And people were saying the Buddhist should do this without even being Buddhist. Yeah. Yeah. But then I would say all our, all our symposia after that kind of turned to, uh, to a practical, the practical thing. And the only term mm -hmm. we've had back to mm -hmm. the theoretical mm -hmm. again is mm -hmm. to ask. Maybe we can't do it without engaging science. Uh, you know, well, I, 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 I think... Otherwise, it's been pretty much... I, I think I recommend we go back to the theoretical because cults, fundamentalism, this is a fundamental motivation for all of this. Um, we need to, to, to rethink all our religions in such a way that they overcome fundamentalism, and not just politically, mm -hmm. but intellectually. Mm -hmm. And... Christianity is desectarianized when it dialogues with Buddhism. Maybe Buddhism is desectarianized, I don't know. But, um, this, but this is, this is, is one. It's a small group of people who the official churches don't recognize as representing them who are desecting. Well, yes, but that's the, the problem. And they, they, must pursue, they must pursue their intellectual labors by every possible means in order to save the church from, from its fundamentalism and sectarianism. But who's saving the church now from its sectarianism? The generation that's not going to church and is, is you know, reading all these other religions and taking courses. And it's not the theologians. I mean, you've had an impact on a group of theologians that are open to this. Yeah, but they are still, yeah, but, but that's negligible compared yeah. with when we speak of the sectarianism mm -hmm. affecting the church. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we, the dialogue is going to be a fringe activity. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, as far as formal dialogue goes, and the rest of it has to be a way of thinking. Yeah. But listen, but I, I think that's a, bit too, that's a bit too defeatist. Look at the Christian Jewish dialogue. You can't say that's a fringe activity. Because the Vatican ah, has yes. certainly taken it to heart. That's Admittedly, true. it is a fringe yes. activity, but the Vatican is part yeah. of the fringe yeah, both, there. Both yeah. religions have been affected by this. Yeah. 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 Um, and people see the need of that, that, that this exchange with Judaism is not just, it, it, it's not just refreshing Christian theology, which it is, and it's not just culturally and intellectually enriching, which it is. It's absolutely essential to overcome the horrors of, of anti-Semitism and to make amends for 2,000 years of anti-Jewish thinking um, and to, 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 to undercut anti-Jewish thinking, which is not so easy, you know. Uh, there's an urgency to that, right? Now, Nostra Etate was originally supposed to be a document of the Church's relationship with Judaism, and they added Islam, and what they said, well, Islam turns out to be amazingly relevant today, you know. And then they added Hinduism and Buddhism, and it was an afterthought. But if they could give the same urgency to the other dialogues, well, the dialogue with Islam is urgent too, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you can get dialogue mm -hmm. sure. So I don't, I think saying it's a fringe activity is, is surrendering too quickly, you know. It's a, it's a slow burning thing, but. And I mean, the theologians must get bored after a while <laughs> of not, I mean, Japanese theologians, I, I don't study them, I don't look at them, but they seem to spend an endless amount of time recycling Western dialogue, you know, Western topics. And, you know, and the Westerners spend all this time writing about the rules, and I mean, there's a shelf of book on dialogue of people who never actually sat down and had a beer with a Buddhist. Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, and they can say all the rules about how this can be done. It's terrible. It's terrible. And, 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 it, 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 it's, it's, and it, it's, it's not only conservative people like Terry Merriman or yeah. Gavin de Costa, it's also the yes. liberals. Yes. The liberals yes. are, are also endlessly recycling um, nice positions, you know, position papers. Now, we. How much time do we have? Minus one minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, could I, could I put skillful means on the back burner? So please read this at home. Okay. I'll ask you questions about the next um, so, um, so, what did we learn today? What did we discover today? Uh, we're trying to put in the context, right? We're trying to broaden the context of what we are doing when we study Buddhist texts and classically Mahayana Buddhist notions. There's a prehistory. Um, there has been a great attraction of those notions, and there's been a great rep repulsion against them as well. Uh, emptiness has been mischar mischaracterized as nihilism, but there are still lots of people today who will say it's nihilism. And non-duality has been mischaracterized as losing, everything's the same, kind of suspend your mind and just say all is one. Uh, and pantheism, um, which, as I think we began to see last week, is not quite fair. Um, so, um, the renewal that people expected from Buddhism, at least the, the philosophers did, it's not clear that Christians did up to very recently. You know, in the 19th century, enthusiasm for Buddhism uh, wasn't particularly Christian, and it was probably very anti-Christian in some cases. Uh, can you think of any 19th century thinker who was both uh, a Christian, enthusiastic Christian, and open to the dialogue with Buddhism. Heidegger, of his 20th century. And how is there here? Rudolf Otto, in the 20th century. Yes. He, he, at least he was interested in Eckhart just as much as in, in, in Vedanta. Um, 
But can I ask that you do, you do something particularly next to me? I mean, in yep. one question, yep. one answer. In the second essay, you, you talk about how um, <coughs> what happens when we look at Christianity through Buddhist eyes. You say it's not a question of um, Christianity has this idea of historical events that, tr that affected and transformed the world. Mm -hmm. okay, and you say, well, we can't just from Buddhist use the whole man idea by him and step in and say, well, these really weren't historical events that transformed the world. Mm -hmm. They were revelations of how reality ultimately is. Mm -hmm. and you say, well, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. The Buddha Sutra take on resurrection and mm -hmm. it, so it's not yeah. enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You need, and then you said, we need something more. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is. Huh? What should I say? Something more what? So nonetheless, a more imminent is what, what, what divine page? action means. What page is that? 170. Very top. Now my question is, okay, so even if we're not going to give up our uh, attack, the idea that Christianity is tied to history and the transformation of the world, and not just transformation of consciousness, <coughs> even if we're not going to give that up, okay, we could learn something from the Buddhists. Absolutely. Whatever, whatever it is, I don't know what yeah. this means, but something, yeah. okay. Now, would you turn that around the other way and say that even if the Buddhists aren't going to give up their idea that everything has to do with the mm -hmm. awakening, mm -hmm. that they have to um, look at the historical transformation that religion has wrought on the world and they have to rethink them mm -hmm. in terms of history? Mm -hmm. And if so, I don't think there's any Buddhists that are really saying that. There are some that are saying in terms of ethics. That's mm -hmm. the closest they come. Mm -hmm. But to actually historicizing religion, the same fairness with what you're mm -hmm. trying to, you know, read the Lotus mm -hmm. Sutra. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there any kind of a balance possible there, or is it? Or are we the only ones who win? It's, a, it's an awfully, an awfully difficult thing because uh, you know Ratzinger made this the main point of Dominus Jesus that he says the difficulty of, the difficulty of accepting definitive eschatological events in history. Now, what is history? What is an eschatological event? The very concepts are ex incredibly elusive, right? Mm -hmm. The basic thing is Christians believe that the death of Christ is the redemption of the human race, and that's a historical event. And uh, as you know, that's a very difficult thing to believe. But um, can we make it more credible by bringing Buddhist ideas to bear on it, the way that John Keenan does when he talks about the resurrection as an enlightenment event? Or the way that um, uh, others do when they when they say that uh, that Karl Reiner and company said that Christ emerges with the evolutionary process. He's a kind of an anthropological threshold. You know, when Christ's death on the cross is kind of self-emptying, which kind of opens up a new way of being human, that kind of thing. These are all ways to make these these drastic historical claims yes. from an ancient biblical world make them more intelligible in a modern evolutionary uh, horizon. Um, I think that it's a very, uh, this is a very big challenge for theology. And if theology can't make that persuasive, you know, I mean, not just persuasive. From the Buddhist side, should they basically like to think of a drastic historical concreteness to the transformation of the world, other than just ideas? And, and could they rethink the Buddhism in order to include that historical dimension? Yes. But what is history? This is the question. What, what is meant by history? You see what I mean? The, the Buddhists uh, might say we have a different idea of history altogether. Yeah. Okay. No. Uh, I mean, and when we say salvation history, that's a very tired expression, you know? And, uh, if, we're, if we're trying to transform our theology in light of all the insights they give us, is there a comparable question on the Buddhist side? That's mm -hmm. my question. I think there is. In some ways, I wonder. Maybe this is a really crude understanding of Buddhism, but I wonder that you know, notion of creations and, and intrinsic value of, of the individual in Christianity might be something that we are lacking mm. in Buddhist traditions. That are uh, maybe it's related to ethics, mm. um, but in some ways, you know, the physics of creation in, in Christianity might be something that you know, Buddhists should think about. And that kind of ties up with history in a sense, because if you take the individual very seriously, then you take the story of all the individuals very seriously. seriously yeah. But of course, um, Indian Buddhism doesn't talk about history very much, but Chinese and Japanese Buddhism, they have historicized everything in the most banal sense that 
every sect and every founder, we have his dates, we have his place, we have his family. Yeah. They're, they're very keen on, on preserving the whole record. So there is a, a sense of history, a sense of historical tradition. Um, but beyond that, um, uh, see, I'm not quite sure, Jim, what you were trying to say about historical development, historical change, historical breakthroughs. Uh, what do those? Friends, you, you raised the question. Christianity yeah. is a historical religion. The resurrection really happened. Mary was really a virgin. Wait a second, wait a second now, we have to be careful. Okay. Yes, I'm, 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 tempted to say, I'm tempted to say yes and no. Oh my, <laughs> my case of pregnancy. So yeah. in the 20th century, we've yeah. come to rethink the notion of history and say, yeah. well, wait a minute, a fact is not, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. was there really an empty tomb? Mm -hmm. What kind of thing is a fact? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and that opens us up to mm -hmm. religious ways of thinking, mm -hmm. but there's still as this old dogmatic tradition that mm -hmm. Christianity is based on historical facts. And a, an event. Stands or falls. The Christ yeah. event. We say the event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's very, loosening it. Yeah. Yeah. It is loosening, yes. The empty it, tomb, whatever you're going to come to. But it's, it's, yes. Okay. And so we've we've kind of softened our position, and the mm -hmm. East has helped us as often, and we can still save it, mm -hmm. but, you know, mm -hmm. publication. Mm -hmm. Now, is there a comparable thing going on in Buddhism? Not saying that we've had this position, but it's time we gave it up and Christians can help us. Oh, I see. Well, there is a, the Pure Land people are always trying to demythologize their, their, um, their mythology. And these are probably a fringe group within the Pure Land. No, I don't mean is there a similar question about but, history. I mean, our question is an historical one. What would yeah. the Buddhist question be? Well, I don't Maybe know. it's about, about mm -hmm. humanity. No, I see what you mean. About ethics, yeah, about yeah. something else. Yeah, yeah. Christianity can help it with and say, well, we've yeah. always had it and we can rephrase yeah. it, but the Christians could help us. You see, if I say anything about this from the outside, about Buddhism, yeah. it, it could be that I misunderstand or it could yeah. be that I'm being very presumptuous. Like, when you say about the, 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 the irreducibility of the individual, I would agree with you. My impression is that Buddhism fails to mm -hmm. do justice in this because of its, its over-insistence on non-self and all that. But it's very hard for me to say that. The Buddhists can say that from their point of view, and then perhaps the, that could be a new topic of dialogue. Do Buddhists say it? Do you need Buddhists well, to say I, I'm it? I'm interested mm -hmm. in having a kind of parody here, yeah. um, give and take, and not just Christians yeah. asking the questions. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it is happening that a lot of people stop going to temples mm -hmm. uh, and burying their family members. They go to the den instead of the temple. They go to what? Den. Uh, it's like a park yeah, where yeah. there's a cemetery, and, yeah, yeah. but it's not affiliated it's with any, uh, Or is, is it spiritual, temple. spiritual, but not It's not, not denominational, it's not, not denominational yeah. mm -hmm. burial ground. Yeah. 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 Um, but I mean, this is actually a ton of its criticism against uh, Japanese Buddhism. So they are incredibly um, attracting a lot of money, and there are a lot of greed inside the temples, and thanks to some of the principles are not embraced by the people representing their temples. Um, I was just wondering, maybe we can learn from the uh, history of Christianity where the people have to revolt against the church. <laughs> I don't know, but just, yeah. just something like that. I'm a little bit nervous, so. Sociological basis. You oh, know, sure. yeah. Temples in Japan are doing badly. Churches in the West are doing badly. Yeah. Is this a symptom of some deep questions that have not been answered that need to be rethought? I'm not sure what you can make of it, really. You know, yeah. people don't want to keep paying so much money for temples. Yeah. It's like Eon have their own. They've got a big business of funerals now. Yeah. yeah. So it's like uh, Eon. Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so, and, and someone, someone whose who's mother-in-law passed away the other day he said to me yesterday, um, uh, it wasn't, in a, it wasn't, we didn't have the services in a, in a temple. No one's going to the temple. This is down in Topol Amen, like near where the, um, where the airport is. No one around that area is going to temples. It's just, just not happening. And it was just people are just, oh, I'm not going to keep paying those, mm -hmm. those fees. But it wasn't just the money. It was the. Um, the everything that went with it, like all the organizing, that's what he said. Mm -hmm. He said it wasn't so much the money, mm -hmm. the cost was the, it was more like the ritual mm -hmm. that was going on. It meant nothing to yeah, it. They just want to get it they mm -hmm. want to they want to get it done in a respectful way 
why yeah. is it? Why do we have to have all these other people yeah. involved in the temple activity? So I think, um, and then there's a, there's specific cases like um, with the, uh, after the break with Minchin and Shoshu in Solvakai, the yeah. the, the, the funerals that they the Eugene saw they hold the um, uh, they don't call priests. Um, they're led by like lay people. Mm-hmm. Some some priests who who left the Minchin and Shoshu do do conduct those funerals. And your wedding was an example. It was right after that. Oh yeah, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. But that, yeah, but a priest wouldn't have, wouldn't have done that. But um, maybe you can get so, the time you on that gap in short. Yeah, that'd be yeah, awesome. Yeah. Or just like, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, But actually, it's strange to say, funerals are very popular in Ireland, and they're an event that bring non church going young people away. No, no, no. And they <laughs> mean, they find it spiritually meaningful. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a meaning to it, though. Here, people yeah. have yeah. that meaning. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I don't think they've lost the meaning. I think they're just, just getting away from the, the this kind of shell yeah. and 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 the 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 association with um, uh, all the associations that came with it, the kind yeah. of community ties and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. It just yeah. seems to be yeah. really. Strange. I went to one of those tears funerals. The tears, yeah, yeah. 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 pretty full. It's just all staged. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Cry, Is it a bit like the famous novel, The Loved One, you know, Forest Lawn, the Moria Hills? You know that, that Evelyn Waugh's novel about funeral industry in, in uh, California? Mm. Well, I think that, that's part of the. But, yeah, but you see, the, the, the churches could make life much easier for themselves if they had an intellectual discussion going on all the time and provide the basis then from which to address these institutional crises, you know? Like, oh, why are now people not coming to Mass? Are they bored? I mean, excuse me, you must think, what are you doing when you celebrate the Mass to begin with? Why do you celebrate it all the time for no reason, like, like a routine? You know, can't you think of something else to do? I mean, they, but they don't even ask those questions. The, the, the bureaucracy is blind, you know? I think bureaucracy, and after four years in seminary, you think that this has can never happen, has anything to do with my ministry. You're not, you're not into theological discussion, you're not into reading books or consulting people. It's been drummed out of you. And this is for experts. Well, that's a total tragedy. I, I once asked, I once taught theologians in Sophia University English. There were about seven of them three women, three seminarians, and a layman. So I asked the last day of class, I asked them, can I ask you, which part of theology are you most interested in? This Tanaka, I like the court history of King David, oh, very good. Next was fundamental theology, next person, Paul Tillich, oh, excellent, excellent. And the man, I said, well, I'm rather unorthodox, I like Rudolf Steiner, <laughs> anthroposophy. And I said, excellent, excellent. First seminarian, I'm not interested in any part of theology. Second seminarian, I'm not interested in any part of theology. Third seminarian, I'm not interested. Yeah. And I said, wow. that's the tragedy of the Catholic Church. <laughs> that's what happened with Islam. Yeah. The, uh, you know, my, my Islamic uh, friend from Montreal, he said one of the problems with Islamic uh, theology is that we pick the smartest one for engineering and science from the class, and we put the dumbest kid from your class into your mom. You know, <laughs> that, that's the tragedy of uh, you know, Islam. Mm-hmm. Is it, yeah, it's maybe the same thing is happening. Yes, yeah. mm, yes. Well, okay, we can't solve the problems. Thank you very much.